We've all been 14 once. Those carefree summers enjoying the break from school, soaking in the sun, and having fun with friends. But what no one expects is that an ordinary walk with their dog on a popular walking trail would end their life before it got a chance to really begin. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. And today, I have an exciting announcement to make. We have a new sponsor, and if you like yummy things, then I suggest you keep watching. Today's sponsor is Nuts.com, and I'm sure you've gotten nuts from the grocery store. Maybe you're like me, and you like pecans or pecans, tell me how you say it. Well, you can find pecans at the grocery store, but don't you want bourbon pecans or sweet and spicy pecans? Or what about pecan brittle or butter toffee pecans? They all sound so yummy to me, and if you are like me, you're eager to try these, so head to nuts.com to see the hundreds of different varieties of nuts that they offer. Nuts.com is your one-stop shop for freshly roasted nuts, dried fruit, sweets, pantry staples like specialty flowers, and more. They have a wide selection, which means you'll find something for everyone, especially if you're looking for a great gift and a quality gift, because at nuts.com, quality is their top priority. They roast their nuts and pop their corn the same day that it ships, so they reach you deliciously fresh. Satisfaction is guaranteed, and I know, because I ordered a bunch of stuff. I got the Greatest Hits gift box with eight different snacks like pistachios, dried strawberries, delicious cashews, and even chocolate-covered nuts. All of them were delicious. They were fresh and full of flavor. I also got some sweets as well, and I won't let anyone have any of them. They're all mine. I got gummy bears and my favorite chocolate covered espresso beans and I could eat this entire bag and I have been and I will. They have that old fashioned holiday candy, which I got as well. And those soft peppermint puffs. I love those. Look at the holiday assortment. And guess what? Right now, Nuts.com is offering new customers a free gift with purchase and free shipping on orders of $29 or more at Nuts.com slash Kimber. And I'm so excited for you to order something great. So go check out all of the delicious options at Nuts.com slash Kimber. You'll receive a free gift and free shipping when you spend $29 or more. That's nuts.com slash Kimber. And I wanna thank nuts.com so much for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get into the case for today. So before we jump in, I just wanna answer one question very quickly from one of you. I've seen this a lot, so I wanted to just quickly give you an answer, but going forward, I'm gonna have a separate channel just for fun to answer these kind of questions, everything from things about me two things about my set, for example. Someone asked, what is this supposed to be exactly? So this is supposed to be an old Victorian house. This is the living room, I'm by the fire, and I'm telling you a story. All the artifacts and things in this room are actually secondhand, they're not brand new, they're all from thrift stores we went hunting for months to just grab a lot of different things that have been owned by other people before, most of which are probably already deceased. So everything in here really means something to me, and I like being surrounded by things that belong to others once. Just like I'm telling you all these stories about people who are no longer with us, I like being surrounded by things of people that are no longer with us because I feel like they just hold a lot of memories. And I just feel very comfortable in this room. It's what I've always envisioned wanting to be in, and I'm actually still in the process of improving this room and adding to this room. But when that little other channel launches, I will let you know so that I can answer all of your questions and we can get right into the case for today. I would like to introduce you to April Dawn Millsap. She was born on January 2nd in the year 2000, just barely missing the opportunity to be able to call herself a 90s baby. She was born to her parents, Bobby and Jennifer Millsap in Wise County, Virginia. April's mother was born with a neurological disorder, and forgive me, I'm gonna to try to pronounce this the best I can, but cerebellar ataxia. It can cause a person to have difficulty walking and maintaining their balance, as well as hand coordination, speech, swallowing, and eye movements. Jennifer's walking as well as her speech were impaired. However, she could think just like anyone else, even if it was hard for her to put those thoughts into words. Having April changed Jennifer's life. April became her world. She was the best thing 
to have ever happened to her. Eventually, Bobby and Jennifer did get divorced, and by the time April was six years old, Jennifer had been dating David Lichtenfeld, and the couple decided to move with a little April to a small village just 30 miles north of Detroit, Michigan, called Armada. It's in Macomb County, and there's only about 2,000 people who live there. It's a quiet and peaceful community known for its friendly residents, its strong sense of community, as well as its beautiful natural surroundings. Armada is a great place to live for people who are looking for a safe and affordable place to raise a family. The village has a very low crime rate and a great school system. There are also plenty of parks in Armada, as well as a variety of little shops and restaurants. It was very common for residents to leave their doors unlocked, even at night. The sense of security was so strong that nobody anticipated any harm or wrongdoing coming to them. This tight-knit community fostered a warm and welcoming environment. One of the highlights of living in Armada is the abundance of outdoor spaces you can visit. There are numerous pathways and trails that are perfect for jogging, walking your dog, biking, or hiking. The residents take full advantage of the beautiful weather and enjoy an active outdoor lifestyle. David and Jennifer were dedicated to be attentive, present, and loving parents to April. David raised her like she was his own biological child, and they developed a very strong bond with one another. They spent so much time together enjoying the outdoors, and kids would be free to run up and down the streets unsupervised. The community was so close that everyone knew if they weren't out watching their own child, another parent would be and they would make sure they were safe. David shared countless moments of joy and laughter with little April. One memory stands out to David. It was a day that they decided to fly a kite. David was running after this kite, and April couldn't help but notice how his belly bounced with every step. With genuine innocence, she shouted, "'Wow, you jiggle when you run!' And David just burst into laughter. He found her observation hilarious, and kids really do say the funniest things. I'm wondering if you remember anything you said or that your kids have said. Please leave it below. I really love connecting in the comments. April was a happy little girl growing up. When she first met someone, she often came off as shy. However, it didn't take long for her to open up and come out of her shell and show her fun-loving personality. Her mom mentioned there were times when April couldn't stop talking. She also loved to have her hair done and to dress up. I do have a few photos of April as a young girl with her cute little dresses on, a necklace, her hair pulled back wearing knee-high boots, and another with curlers and her honey blonde hair and her bright blue sparkling eyes. April grew up with pets. She had two cats and two dogs who were like her furry siblings. The cats' names were Satan and Fluffy, and they couldn't have been more contrasting names, and I'm sure their personalities fit those names. The dogs were Bella, who was a pit bull lab mix, and Penny, a border collie lab mix, and she was black with a beautiful white chest. And Penny loved April. She would follow her all around the house. As soon as April woke up and came out of her room, there was Penny following close behind. They were inseparable. And April knew at a very young age she wanted to be a veterinarian. So David began saving money every week so he could help put her through college one day. The family lived in a quaint little house built in 1905 on the corner of Main Street, only a couple blocks from the town's cute little downtown area. It was also only a two-minute drive to St. Mary's Mystical Rose Parish, where April attended the church youth ministry. As April got older into elementary and middle school, she loved to draw and paint, write poetry and short stories, and she was actually really gifted at drawing anime characters, but as she got into her teen years, her focus shifted to fashion, beauty, makeup, and hanging out with friends, being on her phone, and talking about boys. April had a core group of very close girlfriends with her best friend being Madison Adams, who went by Maddie. They actually met in sixth grade in our Maida Middle School, and they just gravitated towards one another because they were both kind of outcasts. At the time, April was actually struggling with her self-esteem. We've all been teens once, the sense of wonder, but also the struggle of being comfortable in our own skin. It's almost a rite of passage that everyone has to go through at some point in their life, especially when puberty is making it very difficult to always be kind to the face that we see in the mirror, especially when social media is a big part of your life like it was for April. Comparing herself to others had started to take a toll on April's self-image. She became increasingly concerned about her body image, and she started to eat salads and watch her weight very closely. She also decided to dye her light hair to a dark burgundy like her mother's, 
They actually looked even more alike now with their light eyes and their dark red shiny hair. April was very creative. Every Halloween, she came up with unique costumes. In 2010, she looked like the corpse bride. And every year, she seemed to get even more skilled. In 2011, she wore this really creepy but cool white contact lens and black choker with scars painted on her face. But as she got older, April wanted to dress a little prettier rather than scary. And in 2013, she went as Little Red Riding Hood, which is actually quite chilling looking back as this would have been her last Halloween. It was tough for April as a teen, but for those on the outside, they thought that she was beautiful and many young girls wanted to be just like her. It's not always easy to look at yourself the way others do, but others were looking April's way, especially boys. April had boyfriends here and there, but none of them were serious until she met Austin Albertson in seventh grade. He was just a year older than April and they hit it off. And of course, it wasn't without its drama, as most teenage relationships go. April faced her fair share of bullies and even jealous girls. And by eighth grade, her and Austin were still going strong, but there was a classmate named Heather that was trying to get in the middle of them. She liked Austin and would try to break them up. April referred to Heather as a backstabber, someone who was nice to your face because she wanted something. And in this case, she wanted April's boyfriend. But of course, Austin and April remained together. Her stepdad, David, even invited him over to work on cars together so that they could get to know each other. He wanted to give Austin a chance to bond with him because he knew it was the guy that April liked so much. By 2014, April was 14 years old. She was in the eighth grade. It was her final year of middle school, and she'd been dating Austin for just over a year now. That was an exciting year, as April had her confirmation at church, and it was a very special day for her. She was so proud of herself, and her family was so proud of her, too. She took the commitment to her faith, her friends, and her community very seriously. Jennifer remembers taking photos of April at home in her confirmation outfit. There was a cute one of her in Austin, too. And then April with her mom at church. No one could have known what that summer would bring along with its bright, sunny days. Their lives would be filled with darkness, and April would never make it to high school, something she was so looking forward to that fall. On the last day of middle school, she and Maddie actually got into an argument, and it was just silly teenage drama, nothing serious. But as the summer began, April and Maddie went their separate ways. They didn't exchange a single word, and Maddie left town for a vacation with her family. But as time passed, and when July was coming to an end, Maddie returned home, and she realized just how much she missed her best friend. In a moment of reflection, she reached out and she apologized to April. She sent a text to April expressing how bad she felt about their final goodbye and asked if they could meet up soon. And just like that, April and Maddie were back talking and had made plans to see each other soon. But that meeting would not come soon enough. Sadly, Maddie would never get to see her best friend again. One way April liked to stay fit was to use a fitness tracker on her new iPhone that David bought her for Christmas. Her mom got her a cute little teddy bear shaped phone case. She would go on long walks with her dogs. She'd take one of them with her at a time and head out to the Macomb Orchard Trail. It was the perfect place to get in her steps. It's an old rail trail surrounded by nature and all kinds of people from the community, either biking, walking, kids playing, and it wrapped around the entire village weaving in and out through the woods and through town. If you're about to go to Google because you don't know what a rail trail is, don't worry, because I didn't know what it was either, so I did the research for you. A rail trail is a path for walking, biking, horseback riding, and it's actually created from a railroad that's no longer in use. I always wondered what they did when they stopped using them for transportation, and now I know, and you do too if you didn't know this before. So when April went on these walks, she usually started at the trailhead right down the street from her house near the granary, the Armada Grain Company. They actually make pet food there. And it kind of smelled weird in that area, but it was the closest entrance to the trail from Main Street, off Depot Street, and Fulton Street. She would usually walk the trail for about 30 minutes, then turn back around and walk 30 minutes back. So by the time she would get home, it was about an hour and a half walk. It was a great, fun way to get some exercise. And she usually chose Penny to go on these walks with her because she was less rambunctious than Bella. She would never take both of them at the same time because they were way too much trouble, and I can relate. My dogs together, it is not a fun time all the time. She would take these walks every other day, if not every single day. It was part of her normal routine. So on Thursday, July 24th, it was just an ordinary summer day for April and her family. 
April woke up around noon, of course, sleeping in on her summer break, and she spent most of the morning on her phone in her room chatting with her friends, making plans to go shopping, and hang out before school started again. Once up and in the kitchen, April prepared a salad for herself, and David jokingly referred to her meal as rabbit food. Before leaving for work that afternoon, he said goodbye to April like he had done so many times before. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Later, around 5 o'clock that evening, April started getting ready to go on one of her routine walks, and Jennifer saw her packing up her black leather backpack with some dog treats, a water bottle, and a dog bowl. Then she put Penny's leash on, and by 5.30, she was heading out the door. April and her mom exchanged a quick goodbye. Jennifer didn't say, I love you. She didn't embrace her daughter, but she would have if she knew this would be the last time she would see her. But to her, it was just so normal. They'd done this so many times before. So they just did a simple, bye, I'll see you later. She knew she would see April back in an hour or two for dinner. Jennifer had no concerns about April walking the Macomb Orchard Trail. She had walked it alongside April many times and was very familiar with it. It never seemed completely empty. There was always someone there walking or biking the trail, especially on a warm summer evening like that one. But by 7 p.m., Jennifer noticed that April still wasn't back yet. She usually wouldn't be gone for more than two hours maximum, but she wasn't worried because Jennifer was aware that April would sometimes use walking Penny as an excuse to secretly meet up with her boyfriend, Austin, at the park. And now despite being aware of April's secret agenda, Jennifer allowed her daughter to think she was getting away with something because she didn't think it was a big deal, just two teenagers in love. But Jennifer had noticed April hadn't packed much water or food for the dog, so that kind of concerned her. If April hadn't have brought Penny along, she wouldn't have cared so much, but she thought the dog should at least be brought back home if April planned to hang out longer. So she did end up texting April to bring Penny back. April was always glued to her phone, so Jennifer was a little surprised when she didn't get a response back right away. April always texted back within just a couple minutes. After not getting any response, Jennifer texted again, and this time asking April where she was. She still didn't get a response, so she texted April with, call me. Then when she still didn't get an answer, she told April to come home again via text, and still nothing. Jennifer's last text before calling April just said, let me know where you are, but still no text back. So Jennifer ended up placing that call to her daughter only to be greeted by her voicemail box. So she left a message. The fact that her phone went to voicemail, now that was concerning. It was close to 8 p.m. at this point. So she texted April's boyfriend, Austin, asking him if he knew where she was or if he was with April. He actually texted back that he wasn't with April and hadn't heard from her. Well, Jennifer called Austin and she let him know what was going on. He said that him and his friend Alex were just wrapping up some errands, eating some McDonald's, and hanging out at Austin's house so Alex could give him a ride over there to help Jennifer look for April. And as she waited, Jennifer started to get a sick feeling in the pit of her stomach. So she went out driving to the trailhead, but there was no sign of April or Penny, so she went back home. It was about 8.30 or so when Austin and Alex arrived, but it was still fairly light outside, so they made a plan. All three of them were going to go look for April. But before they left, Austin told Jennifer that he got a really weird text from April earlier that evening. At 6.28 p.m., April had texted Austin with, quote, I think I almost got kidnapped, OMFG, end quote. Austin never responded because at the time, he was helping his friend move a TV and he didn't get good service. So that text didn't actually come through until later when he was back in town. And by that time, he just figured she was exaggerating. But now... Jennifer's truly worried. April wasn't the type to make up stories, so the three of them, Austin, Alex, and Jennifer, decided to split up to save time. There were only three ways that April could have gone that evening. There wasn't much to the west, so she either went south towards the trailhead off Depot and Fulton or further down near the car wash, or she went north up the other end of Fulton. So Alex took his car and went north. Austin took April's bike and headed to the trailhead, while Jennifer jumped in her car and looked further south past the trail. At this point, she also called David and let him know what was going on, that April was missing. He was alarmed by the news, and he immediately notified his boss and explained the situation and requested permission to leave work so that he could assist in the search for April. David drove home so anxious. His mind was filled with worry, and he wanted to know that April was safe. 
And it wasn't long before Jennifer got a call from Austin telling her to meet him at the intersection of Fulton and Depot at the trailhead. He said that animal control was out there, and it looked like people were gathering around. Maybe Penny escaped April's grasp and they were all looking for her. So Jennifer quickly made her way back to where Austin was, and by the time she got there, there were two uniformed police officers and they were talking to Austin. Jennifer introduced herself to the officers and explained that she and Austin were looking for her 14-year-old daughter, April Millsap, and her dog, Penny. But what Austin and Jennifer didn't know was that it was true. Animal control was there for Penny. She had gotten loose, and around 8.20 p.m., a young married couple, 26-year-old Matthew Sadaj and his wife, saw a black border collie running all alone down the trail. The couple couldn't help but notice the dog's peculiar behavior. It would dart into the woods and then return to the trail as though it was telling them to come follow. Curious, they made their way off the trail and over a small ravine down towards a drainage ditch. And that's when they saw a couple of white tennis shoes laying on the ground. And then past the shoes, they saw what appeared to be a mannequin lying in the brush. But as Matthew's eyes adjusted, he realized he was actually looking at the partially nude body of a deceased female. He was shocked. He ran back up to the trail, and they found someone to help them and call 911. I actually do have a snippet of that call, and I'll play it for you now. 911? Yes, I'm fairly certain we just found a body along the uh, Mountain Park Trail. Okay, where are you at? Uh, we are between Olmo and North Avenue. It's in our main, uh, there's a subdivision. It's fine with your construction. Is it a male or a female? Female. About how old do you think she is? Uh, I didn't get that close. Okay. Is she at the trail? No, she's off the trail because she's actually woods, her clothes are all picked off. I know that I'll see this in the comments, so I'll say it. It's never a mannequin, is it? The gravity of the situation struck Matthew immediately. This gruesome scene might have remained hidden and gone completely undiscovered if it hadn't been for that dog's persistence. This village only had one police officer on duty that night and Officer Philip Neumeyer of Armada PD. And they don't deal with anything of this magnitude, so right away, they called the Michigan State Police to meet them at the trailhead. Those were the officers that were speaking with Jennifer and Austin. But before they arrived, that one sole officer, Neumeyer, was the first officer to arrive along with animal control, and they made their way down to where Matthew had called 911. It was a very densely wooded area across from a neighborhood off the Macomb Trail. Officer Neumeyer only had to take one look to know how bad the situation was. It was clearly a homicide. Animal control examined the dog. It was clear that she'd stayed by her owner's side the whole time until she was able to alert that couple. She's such a good dog. Detective Sergeant Rebecca MacArthur and Michigan State Police Chief Howard Smith came out shortly thereafter. They were there to assess the scene. The body was in the middle of the woods, and it was not visible from the trail at all. So it was clear that someone had forced her down there. The state that the body was in told a gruesome story of a very vicious attack. She was wearing jean shorts with a black stripe down the sides. They were pulled down along with her underwear and were at her ankles. Her white tank top was ripped and pulled down as well, exposing her bare chest, and her bra was ripped in two pieces between the cups. Her white tennis shoes were scattered in close proximity to her remains. The veteran officers were actually physically and emotionally affected by what they had seen. It was clear from the shoe marks on her skin that she was stomped to death. The imprints were on her cheeks, her forehead, and her neck. The force used was immense. Armada hadn't seen a murder in over 40 years and nothing like this. They could tell that she looked young, like a teenager. The detectives called in crime scene technicians to mark and collect evidence from the scene, and meanwhile, they were radioed with the news that a young man and a young girl's mother were at the trailhead looking for a teenage girl. So they went up there to meet them, and that is where we left off. The officers asked Jennifer what happened, and she told them what she knew, that the last time she saw her daughter April was when she was heading out for a walk with her dog Penny. Detective MacArthur asked Jennifer what April was wearing that day, and she remembered that her daughter changed at least three times, which was definitely typical for a teenager. But when she left, she was wearing jean shorts with a black stripe on the sides, a white tank top, and white tennis shoes. When the detective heard the description of the clothing and knew April was with a dog that matched the description of the one animal control had in its custody, she knew Jennifer's daughter was most likely their victim. So Jennifer was driven down to the Armada PD, and Austin went along as well, and his dad met him there. Once they arrived, 
Jennifer called David and she was in a complete panic. He said she was already very hard to understand because of her speech impediment, but when she was worked up, it was almost impossible to understand her. But he did manage to figure out that she was at the police station, so he headed that way. This police station is small. It's smaller than a normal one-bedroom apartment. It only had one area to interview someone and one waiting room in back where Jennifer sat for at least 30 minutes before anyone met with her. That evening, state police detectives came in and they went over the story with Jennifer. This interview took about an hour or so. And once she told the story a couple of times, she was there for at least a couple more hours and she still wasn't told anything specific. And according to Jennifer, April was a typical teenager. She knew the importance of not being out after dark. She described her daughter as a good girl, responsible and cautious. She never had any problems with her but she got concerned when she wasn't answering her text. The detectives asked her if she was sure that April had a phone with her, and she said yes. She remembered seeing it with her when she left. The reason why they were asking is that a cell phone had not been discovered anywhere near their victim. One of the questions they asked is, was it possible that April might have been meeting someone on the trail? And though Jennifer mentioned meeting Austin there from time to time, she explained that she called Austin and April wasn't with him that day. But they wondered, could he have been at some point? They just believed that the sheer brutality indicated someone who was very angry and was maybe taking that anger out, someone who was close to this victim. She was now being transported to the medical examiner's office after being photographed at the scene and all the evidence documented the way it was when she was found. Meanwhile, David had arrived, but he was told there were way too many people inside the police station, so he had to wait in the parking lot. And as he sat in his car for hours, he listened to the radio and it didn't take long before the news was reporting that a body of a female had been found on the Macomb Orchard Trail. David was putting two and two together. He was hardly able to remain calm as he sat there and waited for Jennifer to come out. By that time, they told her a body was found, but they still hadn't given her any details. She left the station to go back home in the early morning hours of July 25th, when Austin and his father went in for questioning. She and David went back home to wait for the news, about whether this female that they found was indeed April. And I cannot imagine being able to sleep that night, this poor family. And now it was 15-year-old Austin's turn to explain where he was that day. Anyone close to the victim becomes a person of interest. The officer's job is to rule each one of them out. They felt like they ruled out both Jennifer and David at this point, but there were things about Austin that weren't sitting right with them. For one thing, he seemed extremely nervous. Austin explained it was a normal day for him. He was just hanging out at his house, and then one of his friends needed help moving a TV. So around 4.30 p.m., Austin and Alex went to assist this friend in New Haven, which was located about 10 miles south of Armada. Afterward, around 6.30 p.m., he said he and Alex stopped at a McDonald's and went through the drive-thru to get a bite to eat, and then they went back to Austin's to eat and hang out. Now, not too long after this, he got a text and a call from Jennifer about April. He said the last time he saw April was actually on Sunday the 20th because they weren't really talking. Now, he admitted they got into an argument that day. It was after April saw something on his phone that upset her. He insisted that she had the wrong idea about it, but she wouldn't let up. Detectives asked him if that was why he left April's text about almost being kidnapped unanswered. And he said no. He actually didn't see it until much later because he had bad service. But something about the story seemed suspicious. They thought there was a possibility that Austin actually texted himself from April's phone, and he took it with him from the scene. They asked him if they could see his phone and go through his text messages to see if there had been any words exchanged between them prior to April's walk that day. But that's when Austin admitted that he deleted maybe four or five texts, and that didn't look good. He even admitted that saying something to the effect of, that probably doesn't look very good now that she's missing. But he said he just got really nervous when he realized police were involved, and he just didn't want it to look like the last conversation they had was a heated one. He said he was freaking out, and he didn't know what to do. He's upset, he's young, he's never been in this type of situation before, and he said he just thought that April was joking when she texted him about almost getting kidnapped. He didn't see it until 7.44 p.m., so by then he figured she was over it. But the detectives were going hard on him at this point. They took a picture of that text as evidence. And they really pegged him as their prime suspect, even saying, quote, 
We don't think you went out there to premeditate anything, but something might have escalated and something happened, end quote. At one point, Austin's dad was like, listen, you've had him here for hours. Can I take him home now? And it's true. They didn't start questioning him until about 1.30 in the morning, and now it was close to 5 o'clock. They explained that they just really needed to clear him, so he agreed to take a polygraph, which he passed. That still didn't completely rule him out, but they did have enough information to check his alibi for that evening and let him go for now. By the next morning, news of a female's body being found on the Macomb Orchard Trail had spread through Armada. The victim still was not identified, but it was shocking to the small village. Maddie's mom told her that a body had been found, and she immediately texted all of her friends, including April, desperately seeking reassurance that they were all safe. Each one of them texted back, equally horrified about what happened, except for April. She hadn't responded, but at the time, Maddie didn't think much of it. There was so much commotion going on. There was a police presence everywhere. It was overwhelming. At least 50 officers were called in to assist with this investigation, and they cordoned off a portion of the trail with crime scene tape. This is quite a sight to see in a very small village. They were combing the immediate area for clues, and they knew that the small police department in Armada was not going to cut it. So, a makeshift police investigation center was set up at Armada Middle School. There were about 70 officers collaborating with the FBI to gather clues and statements. The community was scared. When they heard the news, parents stopped letting their children play outside because they feared that whoever had done this was still out there lurking in the shadows, looking for their next victim. The streets that were once filled with laughing and smiling children playing together were quiet, except for police cars being parked up and down. They were also making appearances at everyone's door, asking them if they had heard or seen anything out of the ordinary the day before. And finally, it seems like they get a lead. It was from a young girl around April's age, and she said that she did see something peculiar the day prior. A weird, banged up and dented white or grayish box truck with a couple of men inside. They were driving really slow behind her, and then they stopped and they pointed her way. It made her so uncomfortable, she actually took out her phone and shot a video. Now, of course, it's quite far at this point, and the footage is blurry, but the police need anything they can get. They needed to put this out to the public, and that's exactly what they did, but not before a press conference notifying the community about what was going on and who was murdered. That same day, around 1.30 in the afternoon or so, an FBI investigator came to Jennifer and David's door. They were both home at the time, and the investigator informed Jennifer that he had come there for an identification. Without saying much, he hands her a photo of the deceased victim from the neck up. It's not good quality, it's not even that clear, but it was clear enough for Jennifer to know it was her only child, April. No one that was present at that time will ever forget the sound that came out of Jennifer's mouth. She was wailing in pain and in heartbreak. And David couldn't bear to see her that way. And he could not look at that photo. He stumbled out of the room, just grief-stricken, and he almost collapsed against the wall. Nothing prepares you for something like this. All Jennifer wanted to know was why. What did April do to deserve this? She said that she thought, why her child? Why anyone's child? The detectives had encountered countless tragedies in their line of work, but the sheer intensity of Jennifer's reaction had left them overcome with emotions, so much so it was hard for them to get back to work, but they knew that they had to so they could get justice for April. Sometimes we forget that these officers, they're human. They have families of their own. And at this point, the autopsy results had come in, and the chief of police for Armada was ready to face the public. Now I'm going to play you a portion of this press conference right now. This is the Armada Police Chief, Howard Smith, and he asked anyone with information to please contact the police and that the trail was already open to the public because they had already finished combing through the crime scene. But hardly anyone was walking on that trail, especially alone. Here's that press conference now. What we're currently doing is the Armada Police Department and the Michigan State Police are currently investigating a homicide which occurred within the village limits of Armada, happened in the area of Fulton Road and Depot, which is at the south end of town. It happened on the uh, Macomb Orchard Trail, 8.20 last night. 
Uh, preliminary investigation uh, reveals that two adults that were on the trail, using the trail, uh, were alerted to a female's body, which was located in a drainage ditch. That the cause of death was a homicide. The victim has been identified as April Don Millsap. She's 14 years of age and she is from the village of Armada. Detectives are currently looking for a large gray box van that was seen in the area of the crime scene. This is described as a painter's type of van. It has dents all over the van and the van was occupied by two white males. When April's best friend Maddie got the news that her best friend had been killed, she could not believe it. She was devastated. All of April's friends were. It was all anyone was talking about. How could something like this happen to someone just like them? Were they in danger? There were just so many questions. The public was told to be aware that there was not anyone in custody, meaning the killer was still out there. Now I wanna give you a more in-depth understanding of what the medical examiner found. Now, if you do not like to hear this about the injuries in detail, I'm gonna be leaving a timestamp on the screen and also below you can just click it and it will move you past the autopsy. I'm gonna give you a moment because I am going to go into detail here. I already mentioned that her camisole type top and her pink bra were pulled down to her waist. The bra was ripped in between the two cups and she had on a lightweight sweater and that was pulled off her shoulders. Her shorts were only around her left ankle and her underwear was pulled to her ankles, but there was no evidence of forced intercourse. It appeared as though the killer may have been interrupted and therefore in rage or to leave no witnesses, but there was no evidence of forced intercourse. It appeared as though the killer may have been interrupted and therefore in a rage to leave no witnesses to what he intended to do to her, he killed April. There was some leafy material clutched in April's hand. She had on a necklace and there were two earrings found inside her clothing. One was actually stuck against her back. In photos given to the medical examiner, there was blood on her face and her hair. Now behind her right ear, there were what looked to be sawdust clumps, but these are actually fly eggs, which begin to form relatively soon, about 30 to 60 minutes after a body is deceased. So this gave a time frame for April's death. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and asphyxia due to neck compression. Now I wanna go over the injuries described in the doctor's report. There was a bruise over April's right eyelid, and in both eyes she had small hemorrhages. They are broken capillaries, and similar hemorrhages were inside her mouth, inside on her upper and lower lip, and along her gum line. This is caused by increased pressure in the head. There was a bruise to the front of her tongue, the left eye was swollen closed, and there was a cut below her eye, and a bruise above the left eye. There was a cut beneath her left eyebrow arch, and it was determined that this type of injury would have been caused by something smooth. It could be a hand, but it was probably something heavier. Moving on, there was a bruise on the bridge of her nose, and keep in mind, the medical examiner went beyond skin deep. She pulled back the skin and went underneath to see how far these injuries extended, and concluded that these injuries were not due to a mere slap or a punch. It took a lot of force. Next, there were three red linear cuts above her left eyebrow. There was bruising on both of her ears and tiny abrasions. And most significantly, there were red and purple herringbone patterns, a bruise on her skin, on her left jaw, as well as an abrasion to her right jaw. When April's scalp and skull were examined under the skin, there were hemorrhages or bleeding on both sides of her temples, another hemorrhage on the top of her head, as well as the back. And in the head area, more than a slop or a punch caused these injuries as well. Now the medical examiner used a saw to remove the top of the skull and found injuries even deeper into the brain tissue. There was bleeding underneath the dura all around the surface of the brain as well, and multiple bruises on all sides of her actual brain. And this happens as a result of the head being struck with enough force that it moves the brain back and forth inside, hitting the skull. This bleeding was actually inside the skull bone and it could be seen under a microscope. Again, showing just how much force was necessary to cause these injuries. The medical examiner said that it was such extreme force that it's usually seen in car accidents, especially when a pedestrian is struck by a vehicle or they fall from a very high surface. There were 23 separate injuries to the head alone and they could not have been caused by one strike. Moving on to the neck, 
A six-inch red bruise in a herringbone pattern was across the front of her neck. There was an abrasion to the left lower neck, and when looking internally, the doctor examined bleeding underneath the skin of the neck, especially in the left area, and that bleeding went deep into the muscles. There were hemorrhages on and throughout the trachea, and she believes that this is where the blood from the scene came from. Essentially, when a victim is in this state, they actually spit up blood. The thyroid cartilage also had hemorrhages in it. There were 14 additional areas of injury across the rest of her body, and one was internal bleeding above the aorta valve of her heart, showing an impact to April's chest. She had bruises and cuts and scrapes on her arms, and there were bruises and abrasions on other extremities, but the bulk of her serious injuries were to her head and neck, which ultimately caused asphyxiation. What the medical examiner believed happened was that April was hit over the head multiple times and at some point rendered unconscious or at least unable to move. The killer began his violation, but something caused him to stop. At that point, the medical examiner believed the killer stomped on April's head, face, neck, and chest until she was no longer breathing, perhaps even holding their foot on her neck until she took her last breath or stomping her windpipe for at least three or five minutes. This was the opinion because there were clear shoe impressions on her forehead, cheek, and neck area in a herringbone pattern. When I heard this, I was stunned by how brutal it was. I do a lot of these cases, and it's unreal. I don't see how anyone would have had that much rage or anger to do this to someone like her. This is a young girl. The medical examiner said with that shoe tread indicating that someone had stood on her neck, this attack on April could have lasted over 10 minutes from the initial blow to her head until her neck was compressed in order for her to completely stop breathing. Wow. Like this took time and she suffered, which is just terrible. Her estimated time of death was sometime between 6.30 and 8 p.m., but most likely sometime after she alerted Austin that she had almost been kidnapped. The shoe prints were documented and studied. It was their biggest clue because they didn't have any DNA evidence to analyze at this point. They would use these impressions and try to match them to any of the suspects she wear as they moved through interviews and got tips. And a bunch of tips were coming in after that press conference, hundreds from Armada and beyond. Detectives may have been done investigating the scene, but they weren't done combing through Armada. They wanted to try to locate April's cell phone. First, they decided to ping it and see if they could get a GPS location. But with just one ping, the signal just died out. The phone was most likely dead or damaged. So at that point, they assembled a team of 40 people comprising of dedicated detectives and officers. And in order to maximize their efforts, the search area was expanded to encompass three counties, requiring the involvement of every available officer within those police departments. They sent a canine out to the trail. One particular bloodhound named Buster proved instrumental in this search. Buster was given an article of clothing. It was actually a shoe of April's. And then the officer commanded Buster to track that odor. Buster tracked for several streets into Armada, and ultimately, he successfully tracked all the way back to April's house. When they realized that he definitely had April's scent, they continued to tell him to track, and Buster took them west of Omo Road. I'm showing this on a map, but it's kind of on the back of the Macomb Orchard Trail, and ultimately, Buster took the officer to a driveway off of this road, then down that driveway into some brush on the side, and that is where Buster found April's phone in this location right next to a lakefront half a mile east of where she was murdered. I am blown away by how amazing dogs are. It's unbelievable. I mean, look at that. Look at where the murder site was to where this dog was able to find this phone. The phone screen had cracks all over it, and sure enough, as they looked around, Buster located the case which was split into two pieces about 60 feet away. At the crime lab, forensic experts embarked on a comprehensive analysis of April's cell phone. Their primary objective was to uncover any valuable clues that could potentially lead them to April's murderer. By conducting a thorough examination, which included a data dump, an analysis of her texts, her calls, emails, things that she was doing on apps, the detectives were hoping to gain crucial insights into the circumstances surrounding April's murder. As the detectives anxiously waited for the state crime lab to extract the information from April's cell phone, they knew they had to pursue other leads. And one of their priorities was verifying the alibi provided by April's boyfriend, Austin, and to also look closer into their relationship. The detectives decided to speak with Maddie, 
April's best friend, hoping to gain some insights into Austin and his bond with April. And Maddie assured the detectives that April and Austin were a great couple. They were deeply in love with each other, and she emphasized that their relationship seemed strong and genuine. According to Maddie, Austin was always supportive and caring towards April, and she could not fathom him being involved in her murder. But how many times have we heard that? Things aren't always what they seem on the outside. So detectives were dedicated to their efforts of verifying Austin's alibi during the time of April's murder. Austin had claimed that he had visited a McDonald's drive through with his friend Alex, which led detectives to believe there might be some CCTV footage. They did acquire that video evidence from McDonald's, and the detectives were able to establish that Austin was indeed present at the McDonald's around 6.30 p.m., which coincided with the time when April had messaged him about her close encounter with a potential kidnapper. At this point in the investigation, Austin did not appear to be the perpetrator of April's murder because there would have not been enough time for him to leave town, go to the location where she was murdered, go all the way back to his house, and Alex had been driving. He was with him the entire time. Once it became clear to the detectives that Austin was not responsible, their focus shifted towards the possibility of a stranger. Everyone they had questioned who was close to April had been ruled out. She was an ordinary, quiet teen that wasn't involved with anything nefarious. There was still a possibility that she made plans to meet someone at the trail, but who? They were hoping that her texts would help narrow their search. But before that information came back, a tip was called in. After the image of the white van had been distributed, that tip line was flooded with an overwhelming number of phone calls. And among the numerous leads, one particular tip caught the attention of the detectives. A man came forward and claimed to be the driver of the white van. He confessed he was present in the vicinity of the young woman's house who took the video, and he had been near the Macomb Orchard Trail. However, he provided an explanation. He was driving around with two of his employees to point out homes that he had done work on. As a builder, his intention was just to highlight the houses that he had constructed, not pointing to the woman, but the house. He was able to provide an alibi and business information, and the investigators were able to obtain photos of the man and his van, which that young woman positively identified. So they were able to rule him out. He was not involved. So the detectives find themselves back at square one. The media coverage surrounding this murder and the police presence was crucial in triggering recollections of several eyewitnesses on the trail the evening of April's murder. A father, Eric Rushke, and his two young daughters, who were 9 and 13, and had actually recognized April as one of their schoolmates. And Eric actually recognized April as someone in his daughter's confirmation class at church when they crossed paths with her on the trail. After finding out that April had been killed, Eric and his daughters went down to the police station to talk to detectives. Eric told them that he and his daughters were riding bikes starting about 6.10 p.m. on July 24th. They were getting into the part of the trail where it gets more foresty approximately right here. And he distinctly remembered seeing April, she was wearing a backpack and walking her dog while looking down completely engrossed in her phone. He said it was sometime around 625 or so. She was walking westbound as they were coming towards her. The girls exchanged a smile, a hello, and a wave. However, what caught Eric's attention was the presence of a man with a motorcycle, which were prohibited on the trail. No motorized vehicles were allowed. This man wasn't riding it, though. He was actually walking it alongside April. He still had his helmet on, which was a full-face helmet, so Eric did not get a good look at his face. He couldn't provide any identifying characteristics except that he was wearing long pants, a black shirt with a backpack on. Eric and his girls rode down to Pitt Road and turned around and went back the same way. They probably came up to that same area where they saw April on the way there at approximately 6.50 p.m., but by that time, they didn't see April, the man on the motorcycle, or the dog Penny. Because motorcycles are not usually on the trail, this incident stuck out to this father. In addition to the fact he was quite a motorcycle enthusiast, he'd been riding dirt bikes since he was 10 years old. He actually knew what style the bike was. He said it was a converted street legal off-road dirt bike. It was blue and white in color. And according to Eric, the motorcycle was not an old model. It was a more modern one, most likely from the 2000s. And he classified it as an enduro bike which featured a square headlight that he said was on at the time. And so was the motor on the bike. He could hear it, even though it wasn't very loud. Eric said it was idling. And he went the extra mile and searched for images of a similar motorcycle online. He successfully found a picture and handed it over to the detectives, allowing them a visual reference. 
As for the demeanor of the man on the trail with April, well, Eric described the two of them as not exactly talking, but almost like a parent scolding a child. The man seemed tense, and it was a bit uncomfortable. It didn't seem like the two of them were together. The man appeared much older just from his mannerisms, his height, and his build. He was around six feet tall and possibly 200 pounds or so. Armed with this new information, investigators wanted to narrow down their tips to anyone who had been on the trail on the evening of July 24th, between approximately 6 and 8 p.m. And as they waited for more people to come forward, detectives looked up motorcycles that were registered in Michigan. And in 2014 alone, there were 240,321 motorcycles. So almost 250,000. So that made it very challenging to pinpoint the exact owner of the bike described by the eyewitness. However, in a stroke of luck, one of the detectives that were working on April's murder case was returning to the command center. He was driving approximately 25 minutes outside of Armada when something caught his attention. He noticed a long driveway leading up to a garage, and there stood a blue and white motorbike. It was so much of a coincidence, he wasted no time, and he snapped a quick picture of the bike and of the address and handed it over to the team for further investigation. Meanwhile, more eyewitnesses came forward, so I want to go through all of them now. There aren't too many, but it's key in understanding what happened that night. I'm going to reveal what they saw in the order in which it was seen, not exactly in the order in which it was reported, if that makes sense. Mary Stein, a college professor in her 50s, and her husband Douglas were riding their bikes on the Macomb Orchard Trail in Armada on the evening of July 24th. And Mary remembers spotting April and her dog about 100 feet ahead of her, standing near a man who was beside his motorcycle around 6.25 p.m. The two were standing in the middle of the path up ahead, so she was trying to navigate around them, and that's when the girl separated from the man and walked away, moving out of the middle of the road and to the side, walking west. And as Mary passed April, she was, in her words, quote, walking deliberately and gave a tight smile, end quote. She said she either mouthed the words hi or said it out loud, but there was tension in April's face. Mary said that the man was a little ways behind with his motorcycle parked and helmet in his hand, not on his head. So she got a good look at him. When they passed him, he was staring in her direction towards where the girl had walked away. And to her, it seemed like there was some anger in his eyes. He had furrowed eyebrows. And Mary said that the young girl and this older man, they weren't really talking. They were standing close together. And according to Mary, it just seemed odd. She said hello to the man, and he remained silent and put his head down, and she thought that was rude, especially considering this was a very community-centered area. Something about this encounter bothered both her and her husband so much so they talked about it, and they don't usually have small talk on their bike rides. But Mary couldn't help but wonder what that was all about. She asked her husband, what do you think that is, an older boyfriend or a stepdad? She doesn't know why she assumed it was a stepdad, but that's just what came to her mind. For one, the motorcycle being on the trail was strange, and she could tell that the man was much older than the girl. He wasn't dressed in summer or athletic type attire either. Her husband Douglas commented that it was really strange that they didn't hear the motorcycle start up at any point as they rode away. They were in this approximate location on the trail when they had this encounter. This is known as the Liberty Trail area because there's a small trail that comes from Liberty Lane in the subdivision above down to Macomb Orchard Trail. When Mary last saw the man and the young girl, the two of them were about 30 to 40 feet apart, and this was after they separated. Now, Mary and Doug proceeded on their bike ride for a few more miles to Pitt Road, and then they turned around and they rode back the same way they came, and they passed the Liberty Trail area once again. At that point, she did not see the young girl, the man, the motorcycle, or the dog. The next day on Friday, July 25th, Mary heard a news bulletin on the radio in the afternoon. It was about a young girl on the Macomb Orchard Trail that had been murdered, and she thought back to the strange encounter. The police were going to hear from Mary again, but for now, this was confirmation about the motorcycle being in the vicinity of the girl that matched April and, of course, the dog Penny's description. Now, Mary was told that a composite sketch was being made from another eyewitness at the time, which we'll get into in a moment, but that Mary would have the opportunity to review this composite and respond so that she could add what she saw. And this was supposed to happen before it went to the public. 
Now for the next eyewitness. His name is William Buchanan, and he too saw a motorcycle on the trail. William was riding east on his bicycle all the way down to 33 Mile Road and then headed back. When he approached Omo heading back west, he could see a light about a quarter of a mile away, and he thought it was odd in daylight that a light was on, and it was kind of flashing. At first, he thought it was a bicycle light, but as he got closer, he realized it was actually a motorcycle. And that's when he wondered what was it doing on the trail. Now, William is riding his bike fast. He's a speed biker. He's going 17 miles an hour, and the motorcycle was facing him. So he was a bit concerned because he could tell it wasn't straight on the road. It was kind of a bit turned. But as he got even closer, he realized it was parked. The bike is off to the left of the road in the gravel, and there was a man on the bike, but it was not moving. William said he was tall and slender, about six feet tall, and he had on a full face helmet, so he couldn't really tell his age or his identity. But he nodded at the man, and the man nodded back. Now, after passing the man on the motorcycle, William saw a young girl heading west on the edge of the trail. She was looking down and walking fairly quickly with her hair down covering her face, so he did not get a good look at her. The next witness was a guy named Rick Land, and he was also riding his bike quickly. He was speed biking. He saw a black dog on the side of the trail before the ravine that dropped down. The dog was by itself. So he thought, okay, maybe the owner was in the brush relieving themselves or something. So we didn't think much of it. Now, at that point, he was heading east on Macomb Orchard Trail, and he went quite a way. He went all the way to Gazebo Road, and then he came back to the west. At that point, he didn't see the dog, but he heard the dog. It was barking over and over again. When he gets to the area where he first saw the dog, the barking is coming from the north side of the trail. So Rick stops, he looks around, and he realizes the dog must be inside the woods. He still didn't give this that much thought until he got home later after he washed his bike, he put it away, and he was settling down, he put on the news. And that is when he heard the report of a crime on the trail. Now his nephew was a Macomb County deputy. So he called him and he told him to call the tip line. So Rick did, and he left a message for them to contact him, which they did. Now, the next two witnesses, and I know this sounds like a lot, but it's giving you an idea of what people saw, Amy Spinella and her mother, Gail. Now, Gail lives on East Main Street in Madison, and when she got off work, she went on a bike ride with her daughter, Amy. They left the house around 5.50 p.m. and went to the Marathon gas station right here. Then they took Church Street to Depot Street and got onto the trail heading east towards Omo Road. They were going at a very leisurely pace. They have beach cruisers. They're not going very fast at all. And while they're on the trail, both Amy and Gail see a young lady walking a dog. She's looking down at her cell phone around Liberty Trail area. Gail said hello, and the young lady said hi back. Right after they passed her, they heard a motorcycle behind them, and they thought it was really odd. At that point, the motorcycle was going in the same direction that they were. And as it passed, the motorcycle rider actually cut in between Amy and her mother. Then he was able to get ahead And that's when he made a U-turn and came back around in the direction where they saw the young girl walking. At that point, they couldn't get a good look at the guy's face because he was wearing a black helmet with a clear shield and it was down. Amy and Gail kept going until they got to Omo Road and then they turned around and came back the other way. They said it probably only took them 10 minutes. When they were coming back, something caught their attention. They see a motorcycle but this time it's parked on the left side of the trail on the shoulder. It's just past the Liberty Trail area. Now they both thought it was weird, and Amy was cautious because she thought somebody was going to jump out of the brush. She doesn't know why. And Gail was wondering, where was the man that was on that bike? So they kind of slowed down, and they were looking around, and Gail actually said to her daughter, where's the guy in the bike? And she told Amy that she was going to look to the south, and Amy should look to the north as they passed by. Gail didn't see anything. But then, about 25 feet past the bike, Amy heard rustling in the bushes off to the right. And then, she saw a dog. When her eyes went up towards the trees, she suddenly made eye contact with a man that was coming out of the bushes. And his eyes were piercing. She said it was almost like he had done something wrong and had just gotten caught. She thought maybe he was just going to the bathroom. She couldn't really be sure. And since the girl looked so young, In her mind, she thought that this guy must have been young too and that they were somehow friends and he was just goofing off in the woods. When she caught up to her mom, Gail said, maybe we should go back. 
But Amy said absolutely not, that they were going home. And she said it sternly, so that's what they did. It wasn't until the next day afternoon when they found out that there was a murder on Macomb Trail. Amy's dad had called and told them, and Amy's first question was, do you know if there was a black dog there? And he said yes, and she just began to cry because that's when it hit her what she had witnessed. She immediately got on her bike and she went down to the trail to find a police officer and tell them what she saw. She was the one that was asked to help create a composite sketch with a sketch artist. Amy described the man as having piercing eyes and kind of disheveled hair. She couldn't really make out the lips or the chin, so they kind of made some guesses as to what they might look like. Gail was also interviewed afterward, but she hadn't gotten a good look at the man. So now that you know how the composite I talked about was created, remember the police had told Mary, the professor eyewitness, that she would have a chance to review the composite before it went live. Well, that actually didn't end up happening. She ended up seeing the composite a couple days later on Sunday the 27th. And that made her feel very uneasy, and she was upset. Because in her mind, it wasn't accurate. She had seen more of the man than Amy had. But Amy had been at the police station first. So they could have been in a rush to get something out to the public. Mary thought there were elements of the composite that were accurate, but there were a lot of inaccuracies as well. So she felt she needed to call the police and let them know. First, she said that he looked way too young in that composite. The person she saw was at least in his 30s. The hair was wrong. It was lighter. It wasn't curly at all. And it was short. And his face in the sketch was way too full. However, the eyes and the nose matched what she remembered, but overall, she thought this was not on point. She knew that she got a good look at the man, but she was told that now that it was already out to the public, they didn't know what could be done. Maybe some minor adjustments, but that never happened. We will again hear from Mary because she calls in a third time, but for now, let's talk about April's phone data. And this is the craziest part of this case. This is my favorite part the forensic technology. So I'm going to try to explain this the best I can because in my opinion, it's the most important part of this entire case. FBI Special Agent Matthew Zentz was examining the data that was downloaded from Maple's iPhone. And this isn't like looking at a phone itself. It's a big folder with a lot of folders inside, each from different apps on your phone and files that your phone stores, which can be coded files, applications that make your phone run, pictures we took, and so much more. There's a lot. Well, as Agent Zenz is combing through these files, something catches his eye. And I hope I'm going to explain this well because it is so interesting, but it can be confusing. But you're all so smart with this forensic stuff by now that I think you'll get it. What he was looking at appeared to be a screenshot of a text message. And most of us know what screenshots are. They're taken by the user of the phone, whoever's holding it, by pressing a couple buttons and it takes a picture of whatever's on the screen at the moment. Well, it's what's captured that throws Zentz off guard. I'm going to put the actual screenshot on the screen. It's the text that Austin talked about receiving from April. It says, I think I almost got kidnapped, OMFG. But from the looks of it, as you can see, this was like April screenshotting her own text message, right? Because we can see the keyboard below, and then above, we can see Austin's name as the contact. So this makes Zentz wonder why in the world April would have taken a screenshot of her own text message. Well, upon digging deeper, each of these pieces of data have a name. And the name on this one wasn't a photo name like when a user takes a photo of something. Instead, it was an iPhone action. Here's the explanation. Have you ever switched apps on your iPhone? Let's say you go from texting to wanting to open another app and you tap up a little bit and then you see panels of examples, which are kind of like pictures, of the different apps that are open on your phone. And you can choose one of them. Well, the iPhone actually takes photos of where you left off in each of the applications that you were on. And this is in order to give you a photo array that you're seeing here. So at some point, April had been in the middle of switching between different apps, and that internal photo was actually created by her iPhone. She did not take a screenshot of that text. It's very eerie, since we know that is her last text message. But this enabled Zens to look at what other apps were open. And here is the key to this case. The case cracker, if you will. A little throwback to my cousin Vinny. Zens sees there is another app that the iPhone took a screenshot at the time, and it's called Sports Tracker. 
It's a step tracking app for iPhone that helps you record your steps, your speed, the path you took on your walk, your run. This is important to Zents and to this case. If April was using this app while she was on her last walk, and if it were to show her path, it could present them with such useful information. The only issue is that Zents doesn't have the physical phone. He's not looking at the app. It's only coding inside folders and he can't decode them. Well, he has to track down the sports tracker company and it's out in Denmark. So he has to get in touch with his attache in Copenhagen and they're able to retrieve the user data from sports tracker. When it's turned back into the FBI, it's in video format. They kind of like recreated what April's phone would have looked like, what her screen would have shown at the time. You'll understand when I show you this, but this is huge. But it does take them a little while to get it back to the FBI, so we'll come back to this. Because remember the detective that saw that motorcycle in the driveway of that home? Well, the team determined it was similar enough to warrant going back over there to see if they could locate the owner. That detective and a couple other officers arrive at the location, but the motorcycle is no longer there. So they knock on the door and a man answers and he tells them his name is James Muse. When they question him about the motorcycle, he seems a little standoffish. He says he doesn't own one and doesn't know anything about a motorcycle being in his driveway. Well, the detectives can tell he's being a little elusive, so they explain that this has to do with a murder investigation. And finally, Mr. Muse tells them he has a friend that rides a motorcycle and that friend was dropping off some weed to him. This friend's name was James Van Callis, and he doesn't know much about him, no exact address, but he does tell the detectives that he lives out in Wales Township in Goodles, Michigan, which is about a couple towns over, maybe 25 minutes away from Armada. So the detectives go back to the command center and they look up the name James Van Callis. They get an address on Marquette Street, so they quickly have a briefing and they decide that even though it's 11.30 p.m., they're gonna go out there and try to make contact with the supposed owner of this motorcycle. Now, this is a pretty big house. I'd probably call it a mansion out in the middle of nowhere. It's just on a lot of land. Land that's good for growing things. And you know what kind of exchange the guy on the motorcycle was making allegedly with his friend. So you can see what this house looks like. Pretty nice. Well, they knock on the door and a much older man answers. They ask for James Van Callis, and the older man says, I'm James. But they knew that the man they were looking for was in his 30s, he was actually 32. So they ask this older guy, well, is there a son maybe? And he says, oh yes, my son. Yeah, he's also James Van Callis. So he calls him outside. Now the younger James, his father, his mother Brenda, and his girlfriend Crystal came out to the front porch to talk to the police. They inform the family that they're there to gather information to aid them in a murder investigation. And they asked James if he was out in Armada on July 24th, and he says, yes, he was. So the detectives ask him for a rough timeline, like, what did you do? Why were you out there? James is friendly. He has a casual conversation with police. He said he left his house around 5 p.m. heading over to his brother Donnie's house. He says he has to pass Armada on his way to his brother's house but he was about 10 miles out when he realized he forgot his sunglasses. So he drove back home, grabbed them, and then headed out a second time, which was about, he thinks, 5.30 p.m. He said on his way, he stopped by a marathon gas station to take a break because the seat on his bike was very uncomfortable, so he just needed to stretch his legs. Now, I wanna point out that this marathon gas station is in the middle of Armada. It's blocks away from the Macomb Orchard Trail. And it's where Amy and Gail also stopped that day to put air in their bike tires. James said that he called his brother a couple of times trying to see if he was home yet from work and he didn't get an answer, so he just headed out there anyway. When his brother wasn't home, he went out to Tim Hortons in a town called Romeo, since apparently Donnie was supposed to be stopping there or worked there, I wasn't really sure. James said he rode through the parking lot, didn't see his brother, so he proceeded back to Donnie's house and by the time he got there, his brother was home. James says the two of them hung out and then he went back to his parents' house in Marquette. And he knows it was before it got too dark because he's always worried about deers being on the road. So he knows he left Donnie's before dark. So the detectives asked what he was wearing. He said he was wearing a helmet, a Carhartt hoodie, camo pants, and K-Swiss shoes. And he pretty much brought all these items out and kind of just showed the detectives. And then he also showed them his motorcycle, which matched the one in the picture that the detective had taken earlier. 
They took pictures, they document the bike, the helmet, and of course, the tread pattern on the K-Swiss shoes, which if you look at it, it didn't have a herringbone pattern that they were looking for. So they're pretty sure they're at a dead end here. So they leave that night and they reconvene at the command center. The detectives decide that they want to get a written statement and some more detail on the times that James was out in Armada. They also need a better picture of that motorcycle because at the time it was dark and they want it in daylight. So they go back out there the next morning around 10 a.m. This time, only James was home. They kind of go back over all the info from the night before, and James is polite, but he did say he couldn't come by to the station to give a statement at that time because he did have some errands he needed to run but he would stop by later. Detectives take pictures of the bike, and then they just part ways. But they do tell James to call them when he's free so that he can come down to the station later that evening. In the meanwhile, detectives track down James's brother, Donnie Van Callis. This is James's younger brother. And he asked, what did you do on July 24th? And did James come over to your house? Now, Donnie had already been notified by his family that they had been questioned the night before about the Armada murder. So Donnie explained that he worked that day and he spoke with his brother on the phone around, he thinks, 6 o'clock p.m. And then he did have a couple of missed calls from him earlier. Donnie says that he does remember his brother coming over, but doesn't exactly remember what time he arrived. Donnie was very helpful. He was going through his phone, trying to pinpoint the correct times. And there was a text sent to James from Donnie at 6.44 p.m. And it just had one word, home, letting him know he had arrived. So it stands to reason James wasn't there yet. So Donnie thought, okay, maybe he came there at 7 p.m.? Detectives asked if they could take his phone for analysis, and Donnie said he'd rather not. But he said they can go through it while they're there. He also gave them the names of the people that were at his house when James was there. It was his sister's boyfriend, Jonathan, his friend, Matt, a friend named Samantha, and her friend, Leah. Maybe one of them could confirm the timeline. That's all the information that they gathered from Donnie, but when James didn't reconnect later that afternoon, one of the detectives called him to check in about making that statement, and this time, James wasn't very nice. He was irate. He was yelling through the phone, saying that they're on a witch hunt. How dare them ask to take his brother's phone and have it analyzed? He was just going off, and the detective tried to calm him down, saying, listen, we're investigating the murder of a teenager. This is a hard job. We're just doing our job. But James wouldn't let up, and he refused to provide a written statement to them. And this was definitely a red flag. It also shows this man has a temper, and it made them even more suspicious about his whereabouts on the 24th. So they dug deeper into James and his family. 32-year-old James Jr. had quite a sizable rap sheet, including crimes like disorderly conduct, larceny, probation violations, and much more. And from the looks of it, it's pretty clear that he was no stranger to being on the wrong side of the law. And like father, like son, I guess, because 76-year-old James Van Callis Sr. also had a rap sheet. And back in 1995, when he was only 48, James Sr. had been charged and convicted of a sexual crime involving a minor female. He was a registered offender, and if you are familiar, he was convicted of second-degree criminal sexual conduct, and this involves a victim younger than 13. He was also convicted of fourth-degree criminal conduct with a victim 13 to 16. While the detectives working on April's murder were convinced that the motive behind it was sexual, and James' senior's behavior did seem a little bit off when they were over at the home that night. They couldn't shake the feeling that this family was hiding something. However, the detective's gut feeling was not enough to arrest or charge James Sr. or James Jr. with a crime or anything connected to April's murder. Despite the suspicions, the detectives lacked concrete evidence to implicate him or his son. But one detective thought that he might know what James Sr. may have been trying to hide that night. They had spotted some marijuana plants growing on the property when they came by. In the state of Michigan, it is legal to cultivate marijuana as long as you have the proper documentation. When the authorities went to check on the Van Callis family, including James Jr., they found out that he, his father, and his mother, Brenda Pupi, all possessed the required documents granting them the authority to grow marijuana on their property. According to the regulations, they were permitted to cultivate a total number of 36 plants, which would be 12 plants for each individual living there. 
But this enabled the detectives to conduct a search of this grow operation to inspect that they were indeed following the law. And upon further investigation, the detectives uncovered an excess of plants on this property. They also found what looked like a very weird trash dump on the site, and that really piqued their curiosity. When the family was questioned about the surplus of plants, they explained, you know, it was a result of the initial 36 plants failing to grow properly. But despite this excuse about why they were growing more marijuana than was legally allowed, the detectives decide to make an arrest of both James Jr. and Sr. on drug charges. And the detectives investigating April's murder saw an opportunity to further their investigation and decided to petition the court for a search warrant of the Van Callis home in Wales Township. For one, because the bike matched the description of the one seen on the trail and the time James was in the area matched up. So their request was ultimately granted, and they executed a search warrant on this entire home and the property on July 30th. And a lot of agents were on the scene conducting the search. For such a nice house on the outside, the inside was a whole other story. As they stepped inside, they were immediately hit with a strong and just unpleasant odor coming from piles of foul-smelling trash scattered throughout this entire house. This home was filled with garbage and junk, especially when it came to where James was staying. I want you to take a look if you're looking at the screen, and if you're not, come to the screen. Look at this desk. Please tell me he doesn't work from this desk because how? It's littered with soda cans, old food, just rotting garbage. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a pretty messy person. Cleaning is not my talent. But still, this looks like no one has tidied up in a while. In James's bathroom, there was clothes hanging up, a bucket of water on the ground, and the clothing seemed to have been recently worn. They do recall James saying he was wearing camo pants the night of the 24th. And the fact that they were hung up over the shower indicated to them that maybe they were taken off when James washed up after wearing them. So they were documented and seized. They actually seized a number of items. The helmet was next. It was sitting by some window cleaner. And interestingly, the helmet had fibers on it, which looked like they came from maybe a towel or a rag. And it had streak marks like it had been recently wiped down. I mean, it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to clean their motorcycle helmet but still, they took note of it. They took his motorcycle and they also confiscated a shoe with a herringbone pattern on it, as well as James's computer. And they also seized some hand sanitizer, his phone, and an additional phone that was found out in a Ford Explorer that was owned by James Jr. Well, that same day, the news broadcasted videos and pictures of James Jr. and Sr. being arrested. Well, Mary, the eyewitness on the trail, she was following the news story very closely. And when she saw James's face, she knew that was the man she saw on the trail with April. So she's sitting there figuring these detectives were going to call her any minute to do a lineup. But crickets. And this surprised her. But she figured, you know what? They're probably busy. They're going to get in touch soon. They, they have to. And on August 1st, 2014, a funeral service was held at St. Mary Mystical Rose Church in Armada, the same church where April had been confirmed earlier that year. And even though there was an ongoing investigation, the community gathered to pay their final respects to April. There were over 200 people that attended the service. They were united in their grief and support for April's family. Many of them wore pink ribbons because that was April's favorite color. And they put them all over the town, all over the community. And one person that was interviewed there said that the reason she wanted to do that was because the killer was still out there. And she was hoping he would pass by and he would see those ribbons and he would know that they have their eye out. Three ministers officiated the funeral mass, which lasted over an hour. And there was a memory card featuring April's beautiful smile. They were distributed to everyone that was in attendance. As the service progressed, a very sentimental song, it's called Butterfly Kisses. I'm sure you've heard it before, if not. It was the choice that held a special meaning to April's mother and her loved ones. And this evoked a lot of mixed emotions within that chapel. Jennifer, April's mom, was so overwhelmed. She just had tears that were just streaming down her face. This community came together to offer their support and their comfort to Jennifer and her family. Many people came up, they were hugging her. They were talking about their memories with April and they were trying to provide some solace during this difficult time. It was definitely a testament to the impact that April had on the lives of everyone around her. They wanted so badly for her case to be solved. And investigators were still working hard. But Mary 
still hadn't been called in for a lineup and it had been a couple weeks. So she finally reached out to the police on August 14th and they had a more in-depth interview with her as well as a written statement. And she thought for sure they would ask her to see James face to face. She thought it was really important for her to confidently identify him, but they still didn't provide that. And she had to leave for a vacation to Maine. When she returned, she still hadn't been called in. So this woman went above and beyond. She began examining videos on the news, pictures in the media, and she called the police station on August 20th and said James Van Callis was the man she saw on the trail with April. And on a scale from one to 10, with 10 being no doubt, she said she's a 10. She's that confident it was him. It was irritating me that they weren't really doing anything about her being so confident. But by then, the sports tracker data was handed back to Agent Zenz. And the data that was captured during her workout on July 24th included latitude and longitude, the date, the time, and the speed that she was going. There was actually 3,000 data points. And this is where things get really interesting. They now had a video of what April's app recorded on the evening of the 24th, the exact path that she took. But it wasn't as detailed as, let's say, looking at a map on Google Earth. So Zenz, with his expertise, was able to import all of the data points into Google Earth to create a very in-depth animation. And I have this exact video that was presented to the court. Now they have a video of the exact path that April was walking the evening of the 24th, now this video is over an hour long because it's in real time. When they showed it in court, they put it on two times speed so that of course everyone could look at it. Now I'm not gonna be showing you the whole thing because this video would be probably three hours long, but I will show you parts of it and I will slow it down in parts and then I will speed it up in others. April began tracking her steps at 5.50 p.m., making her way from her house on Main to right near the granary off Depot Road. She gets on the Macomb Orchard Trail right here and her average speed is from two to four miles an hour. Now, because she's walking her dog, Penny, she does zigzag a lot. She's stopping here, she's stopping there to let her sniff and go to the bathroom. So she's not always walking in a straight line on the path. Anytime she's walking the trail, she usually, as I said, goes for about 30 minutes, turns around, and a good place to turn around is right near the Liberty Trail area. So that is where she's headed, and she would be going east. Now, after she turns around, she's heading west, of course, and this is the time frame that most of the eyewitnesses say that they saw April and the man on the motorcycle. It matches up to the app. And around 6.20, April speeds up to about 2.2 miles an hour. And then she abruptly changes directions and doubles her pace to 4.4 miles an hour. She's kind of running all around, which is very odd. But then she's back on the main trail. And just eight minutes later, once she felt safe again, presumably thinking that she'd gotten away from a kidnapper, she took out her cell phone and texted her boyfriend with, I think I almost got kidnapped, OMFG. But for April, this danger was far from over for her, as we see from what happens next. And this is really chilling. Even the detective on this case found this next part to be disturbing because it's like we are witnessing April's murder. As she heads along the trail, all of a sudden, things get very chaotic. The movements are sharp. You can tell with these yellow pins here, they mark very important things that are happening. Three phone calls that she made, and sadly where her body was located. I'll tell you when those calls are made as we watch this very telling sequence of events. Remember, this is two times speed and sometimes faster, but you see that the phone does stop. And I'm gonna refer to the phone as April and not just the phone because we know she had her phone in her hand. So she stops briefly and most likely she was confronted by her attacker. Then she darts the other way. And this is when the first phone call is made at 6.31 p.m. A minute later, she makes another call at 6.32, and it's to the exact same number. And then another call to that number at 6.33, all while frantically trying to escape. At trial, they said she called 810-882-2469, which appeared to be a Michigan number, but they never revealed whose number this was. And from the research that I did, it seemed to be a non-working number. So had she frantically dialed wrong and then just kept pressing the call button? We don't know. But from her injuries, we know that she had been struck in the head multiple times. So it stands to reason that she had already been struck at this point, or the killer was attempting to strike her. And with all the evidence provided, detectives believe that the helmet 
was used as a weapon. It was at least three to four pounds and could be easily swung around with enough force to cause serious injuries. They know the weapon was not jagged like a rock. It was smooth because it didn't leave any indentations in April's skin. There are several moments like this one where April is at a standstill. We can only imagine what was happening. Was she crawling? Was she hurt? Was she trying to get up or being pinned down? Maybe getting out of his grasp for a second only to be caught and hit again. We won't know for sure, but for 15 minutes, April was trying her hardest to survive and to get away. That is clear from the path that we can see, and it is extremely heartbreaking. You can see her dart really fast in one direction, and then she stops, and then she goes in another. It's like a sick game of cat and mouse. There are several times before April dies where she's in one place for a little while and then moves just a tiny bit before she's still again. We know that her clothes were taken off. The killer was most likely gaining control in these moments, and April was getting weaker, but she was clearly still trying to escape. At some point, detectives know that the killer actually took April's phone. So some of these steps may have actually been the killer and not April, and her body could have been moved to its final resting place after she was deceased. We know it's right here where it has been marked by the detective. There are times when the phone is moving after they believe she was dead, and that's the killer going back to retrieve the backpack, the leash, and then proceeding to the trail to get his motorcycle. You're gonna see one of the most telling parts right after that. It's right here, 6.44 p.m. All of a sudden, the speed of the phone is traveling up to 18 miles per hour in a straight line. Clearly, this is the killer getting away. And what's great, is that they now have his exact path down the Macomb Orchard Trail and beyond. He goes west down the path, back towards the trailhead at Depot Street and into the town of Armada. The detectives followed this path and they realized the killer rode through the subdivision where Liberty Lane is located. So they make a note to reach out to all of those residents and see if anyone had camera footage of the street. Beyond that, the killer rides out of Armada on Osmo Road, where he ultimately goes down a driveway and the phone stops operating. Detectives were able to match this location on the map to where Buster located April's phone. The killer most likely smashed the phone on the ground and then threw the case and the phone into the bushes where it was found. Wow, I'm finally like able to take a breath because that was a lot. They went to the locations depicted on this animation and evidence ended up being recovered as a result. First, Daniel Koss lived on the corner house off Jefferson and Monroe, and his house was in the path where the killer fled. Well, sure enough, he had not one, but two cameras installed, and they both caught footage of a person riding a motorcycle around 6.51 p.m. And while they can't discern who's riding the motorcycle, they're unable to see a license plate or the killer's face or any identifying characteristics, they can match the times up to when they know the killer was in that location. I kept wondering what his reason was for taking April's phone with him. Was it in case she somehow woke up so she couldn't call for help? Or so she would be harder to identify? Or were his fingerprints on it from possibly trying to grab it out of her hand when she was making those calls? Whatever the case, little did he know that it led the police right to him. It essentially solved this case or at least gave them one of the biggest breaks that they had. Now, detectives also get the CCTV footage from the Marathon gas station, and sure enough, there's the same motorcycle. This was at 6.17 p.m., just minutes away from the trail. When he drives away, he does go in the opposite direction from the trail, but that's because there's a right turn only sign. He actually heads back towards the trail because you see he makes a U-turn and comes back the other way. Now, you know what else? Look at this. Right before he comes back down that road, Amy and Gail can be seen at the bottom of this video as they made their way to the trail after filling up their tires with air. They had been at the same gas station at the same time. That's so eerie. So this puts the killer two minutes away from the trail at 6.17 p.m. And it stands to reason that that's where he went after this because most eyewitnesses saw the guy on the motorcycle around 6.25. That's just eight minutes after the bike is seen at the gas station. They know they have their killer, but is it James Van Callis? Or did he just happen to drive a similar motorcycle? There were other articles that were still missing. So after the path was mapped out, a team went out to canvas the path to see if any of April's missing items 
could be located, like her backpack. They had ATVs, drones, and officers on foot, all doing grid searches along the whole path. They even drained pools, went through backyards and sheds, and eventually they do find the backpack thrown in someone's backyard. I think it was actually in someone's pool, but they never found the leash. DNA analysis was being conducted on all the items that were collected, and none of the items matched April's DNA. They were trying to find a way to connect James to Armada or to April, and what they did confirm was that James had a 14-year-old son that went to the same school with April. Other than that, they didn't find any direct connections between the two of them. They weren't in each other's phones, they didn't text each other, they weren't messaging, but they were still analyzing things like Van Callis' computer at the time. They had also gone back to interview James's girlfriend, Crystal Stadler. It wasn't until the third interview that she finally opened up to them about James. Crystal revealed that she had first encountered James when she was only 19 years old and he was already 27. And she described their initial connection as love at first sight. And in the beginning, James presented himself as kind and charming, but as time went on, his true colors began to surface, revealing a dark and controlling side. And he got physical with her. Crystal's friends hated James and they stopped wanting to associate with her because of him. And she lost a lot of friends. James didn't allow her to get her driver's license or get a car. Instead, he or his parents would drive Crystal wherever she needed to go, if she was allowed to go anywhere at all. Because usually, James didn't allow her to do much. She couldn't see her own family, and she wasn't even allowed to have her own phone. They dated for almost nine years or so. So by the time 2014 came around, she was 26 years old, and she was living with James in his parents' home. But it definitely wasn't the lap of luxury. First of all, only half of that house had on-the-grid electricity. The suite that she and James lived in was run off of a generator that he controlled. So if you needed to clean clothes or even use the toilet, that all ran on the generator. And James would turn it off when he left the house, leaving Crystal unable to do much. She had to fill up buckets of water just to flush the toilet. The computer you saw in that room that I showed you, that was James's. Crystal didn't know the password, and it would only work if the generator was on. James would go on it in the early mornings or at night when he was there. And Crystal had no idea what he did on it, but she knew that he monitored her Facebook account. She didn't use it much, but he unfriended her because he didn't want it to look like he was in a relationship. She had no support system besides his family. They did have a three-year-old child together at the time, and here's a picture of the room they slept in. No bed, no drapes, just sheets hung up over the windows and blankets on the floor. She said they were in the middle of redoing the place, but I feel like it probably looked like this a lot of the time. If Crystal needed to get in touch with James, she said that she would have to ask his mom, Brenda, to text him or call him from her phone. Can you even imagine living like this? I felt so bad for this woman. Crystal said she was actually fearful of James and she felt trapped. She decided to stay with him because she was scared of him. Now with James in jail and the detectives being a source of safety for Crystal, she told them something that she had been hiding. She said that she feels bad for April's mother, being a mother herself. So she felt compelled to tell them what she knew. First of all, she tells them she knows exactly what James was wearing when he left the house on July 24th. It was actually a white shirt with some kind of footballs on it or something. Then he had camo gray pants, a black Carhartt sweatshirt, a black backpack, and he wasn't wearing K-Swiss sneakers. James loved shoes. He had like over 100 pairs, and he had a favorite pair that he always wore. They were black and white Jordans. But ever since that night on July 24th, she said she hadn't seen them, nor had she seen the black Carhartt sweatshirt. She said that James left around 5 p.m., and she never saw him come back to get his sunglasses. He could have. She just didn't see him. He told her he was going to his brother's house to drop off a toothbrush thing and to get some money for dog food. He wasn't home until 8.30 or 9 p.m. It was just getting dark outside by that time. Everything seemed pretty normal, but he did go inside his father's room for quite some time. And what was interesting is this was actually Brenda, James Jr.'s mother, and her new husband's house but her ex-husband lived there along with James Jr. and Crystal and their little boys. It was 
a very unique situation. But later that night, James was in his boxers, he got ready for bed, and that's when she saw an injury on his leg. And she asked him what happened. He told her he was cleaning the dog cage and cut himself. But she hadn't seen that cut any time before he left. A little bit later, they were lying next to each other in bed, and Crystal was permitted to go on Facebook using Brenda's tablet. And when she goes on there, she sees a post about April's murder. And she immediately shows it to James. He takes the tablet, and he's just reading about the murder. But he didn't even comment about it. Then they just went to sleep. But Crystal is awoken by a noise in the middle of the night. And when she looks over, James is not next to her. So she walks over to where she hears this noise, and she sees him in the other room, sitting at his computer desk, cleaning his Jordans with hand sanitizer and a sock. And she had never seen him do anything like this before. It was very unusual. She said, why are you cleaning your shoes? And he told her he was cleaning off some oil that he got on them from earlier. Had never done that before. She goes back to bed, and soon after that, James comes back. He's being all lovey-dovey with her. Those were her words. And he tells her that he messed up, and he needs her to stand by his side. Crystal doesn't even question him about what he's talking about, but she does tell detectives that he never said anything like this to her before. The next morning, he asked her to do a load of laundry, and that was actually unusual. He never wanted her to touch his clothing, but he specifically asked her to clean the Carhartt hoodie, the white shirt, and his camo pants. And when putting the sweatshirt in the wash, she noticed there was a wad of human hair and some grass shavings from inside the pocket. And these leaves and grass, it did not look like it came from their yard. It was a totally different kind of foliage. She put the clump of hair on the bathroom sink, kind of to like save it there, because she was concerned. She didn't know what she could do at that point. They didn't even have a dryer, so she had to hang all the clothes up to dry, and that's why they were hung on the shower when the police found them. That night, the police came to the house around 11.30. James woke her up and told her to come outside with him and his mom and his dad, and they were all being questioned. But that night, she didn't get questioned. She was just listening to the whole interaction. And later, when the police left, James looked at everyone, his whole family, and told them to tell police he was wearing K-Swiss shoes if they asked. But Crystal knew he wasn't. The next day, she noticed that the Air Jordans and a shoebox with a bunch of important paperwork of hers was gone, as well as the clump of hair. At that point, James was wearing the Carhartt sweatshirt, and this was Saturday the 26th. She also saw it on the 27th before his arrest. Crystal thinks it must have been thrown away because she never saw it after that. It was unfortunate that the Jordans were gone, but Crystal told detectives they could find a picture of James wearing them on his Facebook. So she pulled up his profile, and there they were. There was a picture of him wearing the black and white Air Jordans. She also tells them that before the arrest, James threatened her, saying if she said anything, he would bring her down with him. He was really agitated at the time, especially after seeing the composite sketch. And Crystal really thought James had done it. She even confronted him about it, saying that she thought he did. James didn't say anything. And luckily, he was arrested by the 30th, but she was still afraid of his family. Crystal was able to safely move out of James's home and go to her mother's house where she would be safe. They were very thankful that she was brave enough to tell them the truth. With this new information, the detectives were doing a few things. One, they were still trying to get James's brother Donnie to turn over his cell phone. They actually went to his workplace where he ended up lying at first. He said he lost his phone. He did not want to turn over his phone. And the impression that I got after watching and learning everything was that this was more of an inconvenience to Donnie than him trying to hide anything. And you'll understand why. Because eventually he did turn it over after the detectives called it and they confronted him that it wasn't dead, it was actually ringing. Donnie said the police were very polite and he wanted to work with them. He just didn't want to lose possession of his phone. However, he admitted to the police that James had told him to delete the text messages between them. And Donnie responded with absolutely not and he left all of their correspondence on that phone. They eventually had enough to arrest James Van Callis, but it wasn't until October 8th, six months after April's murder, because they wanted to make sure they had a rock solid case against him. James was charged with three counts, first degree premeditated murder, felony murder, and assault with an attempt to commit sexual penetration. After the arrest of James Van Callis, 
His mom, Brenda, she spoke to the media about the devastating impact that this had on their family. Brenda asserted that her son was not responsible for April's murder, that it was basically a witch hunt. She described James as a great father and a great kid who would never be capable of such an act. What is she not seeing? Or what is she seeing that we're not seeing? I do feel bad because it's her son, and I know as a mother, you don't want to imagine that your own child would be capable of such an evil deed. But ma'am, there was a lot of evidence proving that he did this. But in an effort to support James and the Van Callis family, their attorney, Azar Sheik, addressed the media as well. And he emphasized that this was only circumstantial evidence. And there was substantial evidence to prove his client was innocent. His attorney confidently stated that this evidence formed a mountain of proof that James Van Callis Jr. did not commit the murder. In November 2014, James Van Callis Sr. was sentenced for manufacturing marijuana and he received a one-year jail sentence with credit for the 118 days he already served. Finally, in January of 2016, James Van Callis Jr. stood trial for the murder of April Millsap. I watched the entire thing. It's a case that I will never forget, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. This case was regarded as one of the most significant in Macomb County's history. The trial included substantial evidence that strongly pointed towards James Van Callis' guilt. But the jury foreman later admitted that the evidence was pretty overwhelming to the jurors. There was a lot of it presented. All the eyewitnesses, for one thing, and you already know their testimony. But the biggest piece was the sports tracker data. However, there was more damning proof that James was the culprit. After detectives got the information from James's girlfriend, Crystal, about the Air Jordans, they immediately began their investigation in trying to find out what the tread on those shoes looked like. And through their diligent efforts, the detectives were able to identify the make of the sneakers as Flight the Power. The detectives wasted no time and they ordered a pair of Air Jordans online, the same size that James Van Callis Jr. would have worn, which is a size 12. And they discovered that the sneakers had the exact herringbone pattern that they had been looking for. And what's even more disturbing is once they laid those shoes down on the pictures of the shoe prints on April's face, it was clear that the logo, which is called the Jumpman, that Nike uses for Air Jordans, it's Michael Jordan making that jump shot, that was imprinted on April's cheek. That actually hit me really hard. It was sickening. This significant finding strengthened their suspicion that James was connected to April's murder. Let's talk about the internet searches from James's computer from April, May, June, and July. They included searches like, how to make a girl that does not want you want you, how to make a girl fall in love with you, what girls really want, and why does this girl ignore me? There were also videos searched, which included young women. At first I thought, okay, could this have been his young 14-year-old? Because doesn't it sound like a search that an innocent little boy would do? But it turns out from my research that he lived with his mom in Armada. And we know that James was the only person that had access to this computer. In March, the search terms on Google and YouTube were, what does it mean? when a girl tells you she has a boyfriend, what to do when a girl tells you she has a boyfriend, how to tell if a girl likes you, and videos about how to text a girl and how to have sex with a girl. In July, around the 18th, so just days before April's murder, James was searching the easiest way to impress a woman, how to attract a younger woman, how to make a girl fall in love with you, how to make a girl that does not want you want you, why would this girl say I'm too old for her and still hit on me? and do younger girls like older men. In addition to those disturbing searches on his computer, there were cell tower records about where James was on July 24th. And at 6.04, about 20 minutes before he was seen on that trail, his phone was pinging in an Armada tower, as well as 6.14 p.m. and 6.16 p.m. My favorite part of this trial was when Mr. Van Callis himself showed his own true colors. We know he has issues with women. He likes to control them. And he doesn't like taking orders from women. Well, the judge in this case was a woman. And when one eyewitness from the trail wanted to see what his face looked like in his helmet, the prosecution asked James to put it on. James does so. And at this point, the judge keeps asking James to do certain things, stand up, then bend down more, move the helmet this way and that way. And at one point, James had had enough. He yells back at the judge, 
putting his attitude on full display. And in response, his attorney yells at him. He warned him not to say anything further. I have that clip, so I wanted to play it for you. Can you bring the helmet down to the front? I bought it. Oh, 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 oh. Can you push the helmet air off down? The prosecution's theory was that James had sexual tension built up from a young girl that he knew that he was having a hard time getting to sleep with him. This is evidence from the internet searches. Apparently, he was being rejected. The girl must have been saying things like he was too old for her. But in his mind, and according to his searches, this young girl was still making advances towards him. He made those searches just days before he went to the Macomb Trail. This young girl I'm talking about is not April. She was an innocent target for his aggression and just evilness. We won't know if he saw April walking before she made it to the trail because we only know his path afterward and on camera at the gas station. But at some point after making contact with her, he got in in his mind that he wanted more. They believe he probably tried to talk to her and like this other young girl in his life who rejected him, April probably said the same thing. She politely let him know she had a boyfriend. She probably told him in a nice way that she wasn't interested, but that didn't go over well with James. And all of his sexual aggression that was built up, and at 620, when April initially picked up her pace, it's believed that James tried to grab her and pull her into the woods, but she broke free. And eight minutes later, she texted Austin that she almost got kidnapped. At this time, witnesses saw her at least 30 to 50 feet away from James as he was walking his bike or getting back on it after being separated from her. Minutes after that text, it's believed that James struck April in the head from behind using his helmet and she was knocked off balance. He was able to get her down that steep slope next to the trail, but she was able to get up and run. And that's when we see her attempt to make those three calls back to back. But ultimately, James who was continuously hitting April, gained control, and was able to begin to remove her clothing. But something stopped him from continuing his plan. It could have been Penny barking on the trail. We know that one of the witnesses slowed down as he passed by because he heard this barking. It's also been said that he may have hit her so hard that she was already deceased. And if he's not a necrophiliac, he's not gonna proceed with this plan. It sounds disgusting, but the thrill of the chase is over if she's already deceased. For whatever the reason was, James decided to change his plan from intercourse to murder, stomping on April's face, head, and neck until she was no longer breathing. Then he fled the area around the exact same time he got that text from his brother that he was finally home at 6.44 p.m. That's the same time that April's phone started traveling at a high rate of speed out of there. After closing arguments, the jury deliberated for six hours. On February 8, 2016, James Van Callis Jr. was declared guilty of the brutal crimes of first-degree premeditated murder, first-degree felony murder, kidnapping, and attempted forced sexual penetration against April Millsap. Of course, James's mother sat there in disbelief. She was shaking her head. She was crying, rolling her eyes. And then afterward, there were cheers and clapping from the courtroom and lots of hugs. Even James' attorney embraced April's mother, which I thought was a very nice gesture. After all, being a defense attorney is still a job. On March 30th, the sentencing hearing took place and Jennifer had the chance to speak and give an impact statement. Jennifer expressed her confusion and her pain over James's actions. She wanted to know why he had done this to her daughter. What did she ever do for you to do something so brutal? It's truly sad. And James, he just stood there emotionless, just staring. Jennifer went on to express the devastating loss that she had experienced. She referred to James as a thief, that he stole her beautiful daughter away, and he stole the rest of her life. James couldn't wait to read his statement to the court. He clutched it between his shackled hands the whole time. And at the end of her statement, Jennifer said, I hate you, and I can never forgive you. And unfortunately, Jennifer didn't find the closure she was seeking. It didn't bring her daughter back. Oh, when James did speak, he spoke straight to the judge. He called it a sad chain of events that he was wrapped up in. And he tried to explain that there was no evidence to prove that he did anything wrong. No one could truly identify his eye color, his exact bike, or his clothing. He even asked the judge, how many people have eyes that are shaped like the composite? He also used this time to complain about not getting evidence from the prosecution. The judge finally said that the reality is 
We're here to sentence you today, not to argue about a new trial. The judge ultimately sentenced James to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And James's mother, Brenda, had a lot to say to the media. She accused the cops of framing her son. Somebody is out there and the, their kids ain't safe. I'm telling you right now, because if they can do it once, they're going to do it twice. What do you think? I'm really curious by your thoughts. I'm sure you have a lot of them. April's mother expressed her desire for a more severe punishment. However, due to the absence of the death penalty in Michigan, James did receive the maximum sentence that the state could impose upon him. In order to honor and preserve April's memory, her friends and family came together to create a beautiful memorial garden at the head of the Macomb Orchard Trail. This garden serves as a reminder of the vibrant life that was tragically cut short. Those who loved April often find themselves pondering what her life would have been like if she hadn't been cruelly taken away. June 2018 would have been a time where April was celebrating her high school graduation, but instead an empty chair was adorned with white and pink decorations and was left in her honor. Before the names of the graduating class were called, Jennifer Millsap took the stage to accept a degree on behalf of her beloved daughter. It was a deeply emotional moment, and Jennifer was touched by the gesture from the school. I love this garden. It has a statue of her dog, Penny. Two dogs were very pivotal in this story, Buster, who found April's phone, and of course, Penny, who stood by her side. It makes me sad to think about what that poor animal had to witness, but I'm so thankful that she was found as quickly as she was. It brings tears to my eyes. I do want to try to do something maybe every season for one of the families that we talk about. And I'm really compelled to do something for this garden to make sure it's maintained because it is maintained by volunteers and they do have a fund that you can donate to. So I will think about that. And if you see it in another video or you see it in my description box below, do what you can. Anything helps. The reason I do these videos is so the memory of these victims can live on. And this garden serves as a place where you can reflect and you can remember April. I just want to thank you so very much for being here today. And I will see you in my next video. Bye.